Welcome to High Noon, where we discuss controversial subjects with interesting people. I'm Inez Stepman, your host, and I am beyond pleased to kick off the first real episode of this podcast with Dr. Deborah So. Dr. So is a neuroscientist who specializes in gender, sex, and sexual orientation. She's also the author of the book we'll be discussing today, uh, The End of Gender, Debunking the Myths About Sex and Identity in Our Society. Uh, she's also the host of the Dr. Deborah So podcast, and she's a columnist published everywhere from the Wall Street Journal to Playboy, which I think is a, a resume that, that few people um, can, can boast of. Uh, so welcome, Deborah. Thank you so much for uh, joining us on High Noon. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's so great to see you again. Absolutely. Um, so I want to just kick this off. You, you construct your book as a series of myths that you then bring scientific evidence forward to debunk. And, and one of those myths, actually, it's myth number two, um, is, is what you call the social construct myth, right? And I immediately thought of Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex, where she says, one is not born, but made a woman or woman, depending on, on your translation of that, that sort of feminist um, seminal work. Um, actually, that's funny because apparently in the academy, you're not supposed to use seminal work anymore because that's a gendered language, but it is indeed a seminal feminist work. Um, so, and, and you, you see this idea that sex um, and gender, but even biological sex is somehow socially constructed. And we see that myth pervading in all kinds of ways in society. And yet you here you do list it as a myth. Is sex constructed? You know, what, what is the relationship between sex and society and, and how much does biology play into um, sex and gender and how we relate to our bodies? So sex and gender definitely are not socially constructed. And for whatever reason, it's become hateful nowadays to talk about biology. And I don't think it should be. Um, so as you mentioned, in the end of gender, I go through nine different myths. And these are myths that are commonly taken at basically face value in our society today. So myth number two is gender is a social construct. And this is something I find really disturbing because the way this is presented now, it, it, there's never two sides to the conversation. It's very much, especially in mainstream news, it's reported on as if this is fact, even though it is very much not true. Gender is uh, biologically driven. This is the case for people who are gender, gender typical or atypical. And this is the case for people who identify as their birth sex or people who are intersex or transgender. So, I mean, this is, it's not helpful for us. I think, I think the underlying sentiment was that this would help to lead to female emancipation if we say that female gender roles are separate from the female sex. But what I think is it's actually just made things much more confusing for women. Um, it doesn't help us make more enlightened choices. And if anything, it's actually, I think, hurting our ability, especially for those who truly believe it is a gender, uh, social construct. It's actually hurting their ability to make meaningful choices in life. I'm so glad that uh, you mentioned that because one of the other aspects of your book, you talk about, for example, some of the realities, the biological realities of particularly heterosexual dating. Um, I, I find these biological realities empowering um, to know the truth and then to be able to respond to the truth um, and to organize my life in such a way that, you know, I take into account um, certain biological truths about womanhood. I actually find that incredibly empowering, but it seems that so many people today um, I, uh, find it somehow offensive or they find it constricting or, or they find that... Um, it, it, it somehow disallows them from being an exception from some general gender trait. Um, have we lost the ability to just embrace exceptions? You know, there's that old cliche, right? The, um, what is it? The, the exception that proves the rule. It doesn't seem we believe in that anymore. We want the exception to totally swallow the rule. We seem wholly um, uncomfortable with the idea of outliers, exceptions, um, every, every, um, you know, sort of unique instance or counter example is taken as proof that the rule doesn't exist, particularly when it comes to sex. And I do feel there is an underlying sentiment of sexism in that, in that some feminists who are really pushing this mandate, I think it comes from this idea that there is maybe they on some level feel some shame about being feminine or about being women, because I don't think it should be considered inferior of women to be feminine or to be different from men. No one's saying that. It's the that value judgment is being made. It's not being made by the biological science. It's by, it being made by people who are interpreting the science that way. So like you said, I think just because there are some women who are not 
stereotypically feminine or who maybe do not um, represent what you would see on average among women. And I, of course, you can't speak for all women as I as a woman cannot speak for all women. But there are some averages that we see. And to point to the outliers and to say that that should be the rule is, again, not going to speak to most women. And in, in the case of, say, dating or sex or courtship, young women especially are being told that they are no different from young men if they date men. And so I, I don't think that's helpful to them because then they don't understand, well, why is it they don't enjoy casual sex as much? Or why mm -hmm. is it that sex is a greater investment for them, that their male, male, male peers are not invested in the same way? And if they are being told and they believe that evolutionary psychology is just a myth or it's outdated, it's not going to bring them happiness because they're going to essentially be fighting what's internally wired in them and what has been actually beneficial to their ancestors for however many millions of years. Yeah, we have such an allergy to, um, you know, talking about biology as in any way guiding our lives. Um, but but as I said, I, I find it empowering because then you can, you know, plan your life in such a way to account for biological realities, like, for example, the one you mentioned about men and women um, having different biological imperatives when it comes to sex that then show up in, um, you know, for example, how much they enjoy casual sex or it, it, it honestly, it breaks my heart because honestly, uh, we, we, I hear from young women when back, you know, before COVID, when I used to um, speak on college campuses and speak to college women, you know, the, the dating atmosphere now is one in which you're terrified, actually, particularly if you are a woman of quote unquote, catching feelings um, after sex that women are like talking themselves into uh, the idea and, and um, that it's bad somehow to be emotionally invested in sex. Um, and ironically, it's, it's women who have to talk themselves into this because of course, as you, you write in your book, um, women have evolutionary reasons for being more invested in sex, for being the choosy sex. Um, and again, to, to the idea of exceptions, right? That doesn't mean that there are zero women out there who enjoy casual sex and take pleasure from it. Um, but it does mean that on average, women are not going to be able to play the same game as men. You know, do you do you think that um, young women today are, um, you know, held back in some way? Do you worry that they will force themselves in this and a thousand other ways? I mean, can, we can talk about um, the the rapid onset transitioning um issue as well, which you touch on at length in your book, but do you worry that young women are being pressured it, it, almost um, against being feminine, like that being feminine is, is itself something um, to be ashamed of or means that you're weak or uh, unambitious or, or any number of, of traits that, you know, uh, we discourage as society? I do think that, and I mean, going back to your point about young women, the, that's what motivated me actually to write that chapter is because I would get so much feedback from young women who would send me messages and say that they feel so conflicted. They get all sorts of mixed messages from the media, um, but that does not seem to represent how they actually feel or how they feel they should approach dating. And s young men are not sitting there trying to convince themselves not to have feelings when they go into a casual sex situation. They're just not. So that speaks to the difference already. And I think for young women to have to deny that, it's really quite heartbreaking, I think, because as you said, it's it's just, I don't think it's anything to be ashamed of. And we shouldn't have to change who we are in order to find a, a compatible partner. So in terms of, do I think society devalues femininity? I do. And I mean, we see this in terms of, as you're saying, rapid onset gender dysphoria, the larger non-binary trend that we're seeing where young girls who may not be stereotypically feminine think that because they're not girly girls, this must mean they're actually really men or that they should be a third gender or for maybe some women, some young women who do not want to experience sexism or they see that their male peers are having an easier time in whatever other capacity, they think I'll have a better life if I am like that. And so they decide to transition or um, essentially not, they don't want to identify as female. And we're not having so much of a conversation to say, just because you feel different or because you feel uncomfortable in your body, that doesn't mean you shouldn't be a woman or just because maybe you are different in some way. There's no, there's, there should be no shame around being female. So a lot of this, I think on some level, there is 
of course I'm in favor of people being able to do however they want, being able to express themselves however they want and pursue what they find meaningful and how they want to live their life. But my issue is when it starts to become dogmatic. And I say this as someone who I still consider myself to be a liberal. And I, in the book I read about how he's very feminist. And it makes me really sad to see how far, I mean, it's become a total train wreck now in terms of the way liberals or left-leaning people feel that they need to talk about gender or in terms of the science denial how bad left-leaning science now has become when it comes to issues around gender identity. I'm glad you mentioned the the science denial because you dedicate quite a bit of your book. Um, you, you have a number of examples in here of either studies that were pulled from journals without a clear explanation as to why um, people in academia who were essentially, you know, hounded out. Um, you, you yourself, of course, left academia when you realized that you wouldn't be able to pursue the truth or, or through your research in a, a way that was um, sort of not cognizant or didn't, didn't kowtow to um, whatever the shibboleths, the ideological shibboleths um, were at that time. And it seems like they've only gotten worse since then. Um, you know, do, as a scientist, do you worry that there will be a backlash to this whereby people stop trusting scientific institutions altogether. I mean, I, I find this to be a really relevant conversation um, given that we're in the middle of this COVID pandemic still, hopefully at the tail end of it um, here in the United States. I know you're Canadian. Um, we've had the CDC has waded into political questions. So, for example, they uh, they blessed the large gatherings last summer um, in the name of Black Lives Matter protests after previously telling people that they couldn't even get together with family for a funeral. That that kind of politicization of scientific institutions really tanks public trust in them. Um, do you do you worry about two things? One. Um, how much harder is the case that you're making that biological sex is real, that you make in this book, biological sex is real, um, that it's binary, uh, that it, it influences our lives in a myriad of ways that are really important to who we are? Um, do you worry that the case is going to get that much harder given the fact that there are unlikely, you say this pretty pretty blatantly in this book, there are unlikely to be any more studies that confirm your perspective on this um, because those studies just won't be published and they won't even be submitted because they won't get money for, for grants. The um, professors and, and researchers will be too afraid to touch the subjects. I mean, how are you going to make this case when uh, somebody is going to point to a mountain of recent studies, let's say in 10 years, that show the exact opposite of the science they're pointing to in this book? It is terrifying. I mean, people should not have to ever question whether science that's being published. I mean, the thing is, science, if it's rigorously done, it goes through the peer review process. So it goes through other people in the field, other experts in the field are going to vet it and make sure that it was done, the study was done properly so that whatever the researchers found is hopefully as close of an approximation of the truth as is possible. So by the time it reaches publication, the public sees it. Ideally, they shouldn't have to question whether the findings are accurate or if they're ideological. But that's not the climate that we're in right now. And as you mentioned, we see this across a number of domains. It's not just in gender and biological sex. It's also, as you mentioned, with COVID, there's quite a bit of hypocrisy in terms of policy there. I mean, it's, it's basically everything nowadays because I think everything has become so political. So... I do worry about that. I mean, in, in my book, I list all of the citations of legitimate research. So if people are interested in learning more, they can look up the studies themselves. And I would just say for new studies that come out, I, in the book, I have a chapter that goes into what you can look for in terms of determining for yourself whether a study is biased or not. I, again, ideally, I don't think people should have to go to that length of investigation to find out what's true or not. I think people ideally would be able to just read about something in a news outlet and say, okay, this is what they found great, but now you have to go to this other extra length. And then with biological sex, I mean, it's crazy to me because I see some people, some prominent so-called experts saying that biological sex doesn't really exist, which that makes absolutely no sense whatsoever, especially in the context of transgender rights. I'm fully in support of equal rights and legal protections for trans people. But if you start saying that biological sex doesn't exist, does that not invalidate the existence of transgender people? Because the, what are they transitioning? Right. What's the point of transitioning yeah, it, <laughs> if it biological sex sense. doesn't exist? So I think also people have a, a gut sense when something does not seem to 
sound quite right, and especially issues around gender or biology or biological sex. Most people know already that these are hotly politicized issues. So you can bet that if something comes out now or if a study comes out now, I would say 99.9% .9 of the time is going to be something that has a little bit of a political flavor to it. Yeah, you give some great pra pragmatic, practical advice. One of them was the depressing uh, note that in, in the realm of, of sex and gender, that you put way more weight on studies that have been done at least 10 years ago than, than more recent studies because you worry that those studies were politicized. Um, but but you also have a number of other good tips in there, like and, and some of them are depressing. Is like they're kind of depressing tips, right? Um, like for example, you you, you mentioned that we should check whether somebody, if somebody is is um, publishing in a scientific field, a hard scientific field like sexology um, or or neurobiology, that you should check it to see if they also co-author studies with folks in in um, philosophy, which was my major, <laughs> uh, or in um, the the quote unquote studies fields, right? Women's studies, queer studies, so on. Um, and uh, that, I mean, again, these are like kind of depressing, like you shouldn't have to investigate someone's political bio. Um, it, it almost a, a friend of mine, Katya Sedwick, um, wrote a, a really great article um, a couple weeks ago. Both of us have roots in the former USSR, um, her directly, but our, my parents were in the Soviet bloc um, in Poland um, and I was born here, thankfully, but it almost makes the USSR, in some ways it was obviously way, way, way worse, but um, in some ways it was, in this particular way, it was almost better because they had to actually build wealth. They were not an incredibly wealthy, prosperous country the way that the first world is today, Canada, the United States. Um, so things like mathematics and engineering, to some extent, at least to some extent, were, were these kind of free zones um, where you could actually pursue the truth because it turns out at the end of the day, if you know, if the plane doesn't stay up, like the Soviet Union had no planes, um, <laughs> and that doesn't mean that there, there weren't politicization of who could get into university and, and so on. There was obviously terrible there too, but once you were actually doing the work, they did tend at least to some degree to leave you alone. And in that sense, it almost seems like our regime today is, is worse that it's politicizing even a field like mathematics or neurobiology, things where, you know, the right answer um, could could very well be the difference between, you know, engineering failure and success, or could very well in the in the, the realm we're talking about here, could very well be the difference between irreversible damage, as Abigail Schreier's book is called, um, or allowing people to uh, take on interventions, surgical interventions, hormonal interventions that have lifelong consequences. Yeah, and I do want to say that not every scholar, obviously, from these disciplines are suspect when you're saying about philosophy or, or disciplines with the word of studies course. in the title. But I would definitely say there's a pressure for even for faculty who don't go along with it or don't feel that this aligns with their, their personal goals. They feel pressure to go along with it because they don't want to be ostracized. They don't want to be singled out as someone who's not going along with it. And also because it does help their careers, ultimately. So uh, in terms of, I, it's, it's really crazy to me that this is happening in academia because you would think because we are so, so fortunate to be doing so well in Western society that we would want to continue prospering. But I think this is what happens when people have too much time on their hands. And a lot of these academics are sitting around creating problems when they could be solving important ones. So yeah, I, I do think this is, I mean, the children, I have an entire chapter devoted to why young children with gender dysphoria shouldn't transition. And we're going to see the ramifications of this in a, in a really devastating way in a few years. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a really hard question now. And um, I'm sure that it's it's one that you've thought a lot about. It's obvious in the book that you thought a lot about. It. You actually frame one of your chapters surrounding one of these encounters with parents. But I mean, what what would you tell parents um, who might have a child who is coming home at the age of you know ten, eleven, twelve, fourteen, you know, fifteen, and saying, you know, mom, dad, I I don't feel comfortable in my body. I think I'm gender dysphoric. Um, and, and I want, I want to be treated as the opposite sex and eventually to transition. And, you know, what, what advice would you give a parent in how to support their child, but also, you know, protect them from potentially life-changing consequences, negative consequences that they're going to have to live with for the rest of their lives? There's a lot I would say to those parents. I would say, number one, don't feel bad about questioning it. 
do not feel that that makes you a hateful person or a bad parent because you know your child. In many cases, I mean, there has been one study to show this by Lisa Littman, um, that these kids will go on the internet. I mean, this is what they're being told. That this is what you say to your parents in order to get them to let you to transition. Whether or not the child actually has gender dysphoria, whether or not transition will actually benefit them in the long run. So all of the research literature shows that the vast majority of kids will desist, so they'll no longer feel gender dysphoric by puberty. So these are kids who are basically from the womb. They are gender atypical. They're more like the opposite sex. But even, even so, if they're left alone, they're likely going to grow up to be comfortable in their birth sex and in the body they were given. We see this in your wave of young, predominantly young women, who have no signs of gender dysphoria up until the point when they say they want to transition. And in many cases, it's very startling to parents because, again, there's no history. So they're, they're wondering, well, where is this coming from? And then there's this larger narrative that it, of suicidality. So saying that young people who don't have access to transition are at a greater risk of suicide. We also have so-called conversion therapy bans for gender identity, which basically forces clinicians to take a gender affirmative approach in therapy. So conversion therapy for sexual orientation is different from conversion therapy for gender identity in that conversion therapy for sexual orientation, so attempts to change someone's sexual orientation uh, do not work, they're not ethical, but gender identity is flexible in young children. So to ask a child and try to understand where their feelings about their gender are coming from, that's been conflated as harmful even though from a research perspective, it's not. And I don't do clinical work anymore and I don't work with these kids, but my colleagues will tell me that they cannot do their work ethically anymore. In Canada, we have a, a bill that's about to go into law that will criminalize any of these therapeutic interventions that, that are not uh, facilitating um, affirmation in children with regard to their gender. So, I mean, the larger thing to take away from that for parents is just know that a lot of what you are seeing presented about this is not the full picture. In chapter five, I go through all of the criticisms that I have received since I started talking about this issue, all the criticisms of the desistance research literature, a lot of the so-called things that people say are myths that are not myths. Um, and I would just say, I mean, there's another piece that I was gonna add to that and I've lost it now. Just basically, it's this is something that kids are, are being exposed to everywhere. Now, it's in education, it's on social media, it's in their friends, and I think it's important to try to get ahead of it if you can with your kids and let them know that they're going to be exposed to these things. And just because they might question the way they feel about their bodies or about the sex they were born as doesn't mean they're better off transitioning. Um, that would be the main thing. But there's, I mean, there's just so much to say about this because it, it's, I feel like every week there's something new and people are being bombarded with this and it's just not helpful. You know, who, who doesn't feel it? And um, we can only, we can speak as women, um, not for all women, obviously, but we can speak as women. I mean, what, what young girl going through puberty isn't uncomfortable with her body? I would say that's more the exception than the rule. Um, you know, is, is there something, because Obviously, when we're younger, we're uncomfortable with our bodies, um, especially as we go through transitions like puberty. Um, is there something about the female experience um, that we lose when we lose this idea of the gender binary is not socially constructed, not a series of you know, sex stereotypes imposed by society, but as, as rooted in the biological body? I mean, I'm thinking now even as adult women, um, we are being told that we can't talk about uniquely female experiences, right? Um, like menstruation or um, giving birth or, or being mothers. Um, the, these are experiences rooted in, in the natural female body and, and it's becoming offensive, right? Um, the, you get a lot of backlash if to, just to say that, for example, women experience pregnancy and men do not. Um, this is, this is uh, the female experience is almost becoming uh, a taboo or something um, that people are afraid to talk about. Yeah, and actually to your point about puberty being a difficult time it's, and menstruation, it's very, very normal for young women to be uncomfortable in their bodies going through that process. I mean, for everyone to be uncomfortable, but in the context of this conversation, because that's something that they're also not being told. They think that because they don't like having their period or they don't like that they've developed breasts, that that suddenly means that they're not female or that they should seek interventions to change that about themselves. 
And so I think that's really unfortunate because the message should be that, like you said, it's it's totally normal to feel that way. It doesn't mean you're not a woman. And it's something I would almost say to take pride in. Um, so yeah, with regards to language around women, that has become verboten for whatever, well, I do understand why, because activism, trans activism has become so militant that any reference to being female that is not inclusive of trans women is deemed hateful. Um, and I'm all in favor of, of being inclusive and being sensitive with language, but I don't think that requires us forbidding talking about female bodies or female physiology um, entirely, or that doing so is bigoted. Because again, there's there are certain things that from a very factual standpoint, women who are born women experience that trans women do not. And I have a chapter in the book talking about how there are differences between women who are born women and trans women. And these differences play out in meaningful ways with regards to, as you mentioned, say, medical decisions or women's spaces or prisons and sports. And to deny that is is really harmful to women. Yeah, here in the US, we have this huge debate now over the Equality Act, the Equal Rights Amendment, um, which will functionally do a lot of the same things. And then, of course, over women's sports and whether um, boys, biological boys who transition um, to being girls, um, whether that's a fair competition. And again, we always have this in um, sort of battle about about the science, right? Um, something that should be completely common sense. I mean, I, I feel like every every person, if they're honest with themselves, knows that there's a difference in strength and speed um, between boys and girls, and an even larger difference the older they get as they get into college. Um, you know, th th they're, that men are bigger, they're stronger, they're faster, um, and therefore they're, the competitions are sex segregated when they're reliant on those kinds of skills. Like, there are a few sports that aren't, and therefore... Um, there, those sports are often integrated by sex, right? So for example, horseback riding or um, sometimes sailing or um, there's a couple other sports where it's it's been integrated. But now we're seeing this huge fight, right? We had two, um, we had a Republican governor, Christy Nome, actually veto a bill that would have um, forbidden uh, boys, biologically born boys from participating in women's sports. And we actually had the... Um, NCAA try to assert influence, which is like the the um, sports league, to try to assert, assert uh, influence over a state to say, no, 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 uh, there are no biological differences. This is purely a matter of fairness and inclusion. Um, is it fair to even let's say if let's say that somebody does um, take hormones and um, maybe not go through full surgery, but but taking hormones for a long time, because we're, we're hearing uh, that there was a, some study out of UCLA a couple years ago, to your point about recent science that said, oh, after two years of taking cross-sex hormones, um, there there are no more physical advantages for boys on the on the track field, track and field, right? Um, is that true? No, <laughs> no. Amazingly, there was another study that came out recently. It's It's cited in my book, that shows that, I mean, it's a miracle that this was published, showing that after being on cross-sex hormones for a year, there are no differences in terms of muscle strength um, or size. But even outside of that, if you, the way it's being, this issue is being spoken about is as though cross-sex hormones are going to completely eliminate any differences that are brought about by undergoing male puberty and that foundation that is set. And that's just not true. But I think what's even scarier is that some people actually genuinely believe that there are no biological differences, I guess because of what they're being taught in their education. And so they genuinely think this is an issue about discrimination only, because I will see people saying, how come the critics, so someone like myself, is not concerned with trans boys? Why are they only picking on trans girls? And I'm thinking, if you had any understanding of biology, that would be a self-evident answer. But um, th that is one area I, I'm just astounded at where we are and the fact that it's pretty clear, I think, to most people. Most people will bite their tongue when it comes to things like children transitioning or gender neutral language. But when it comes to sport, it's such a visceral reaction that you have when you watch the competition. And the fact that you, when you listen to the young women who are being affected by this, who are having their scholarships essentially taken from them, you know, they train their entire lives for these opportunities and that's not fair to them. So 
we'll see what happens. And uh, I mean, it's, there's just so much back and forth with this, but I really do hope that in the end, fairness wins out. Yeah, I mean, and and fairness uh, includes fairness to to girls, of course, and it, it does seem that women and girls are taking the brunt um, of this this push to eliminate sex differences or to pretend that they're socially constructed and therefore it can be undone by a different social construction, right? When it comes to to prisons, for example, we're now increasingly, um, I believe, the state of California recently uh, decided that it's not going to collect data on inmates that um, claimed uh, uh, female identity, male inmates who claimed female identity and then were placed in women's prisons. Um, they're not even going to collect that data. Um, you know, <laughs> so we're, we're seeing this across the board. And, and to me, and I think your, your book really lays this out beautifully, um, the most important aspect of his conversation, of course, sex and gender are interesting topics in and of themselves, and, and they're fascinating. And I assume that's why you decided to go into the kind of research um, that you have. It's, it's a very, it's a fun conversation. These differences are interesting and relevant. Um, but to me, what disturbs me the most about this whole conversation that we're having is this demand to accept things that seem on the face of it to be obviously untrue. I think that's why sports, as you mentioned, is such a, a flashpoint because people can just use their eyes and see. They see that boys are faster. They see that in Connecticut, the you know the top one and two finishers in 19 track meets have both been trans girls, right? Biological boys competing against biological girls. Um, and, and they can see this with their own eyes and yet so few people are, are willing um, to, to go ahead and say it, I guess I would ask you as somebody who went ahead and, and stood up and left academia so that you could continue to pursue uh, the truth as you see it and to, to speak about the science as um, you understand it, you know, how, how do we get people to stop being silent on this issue that they know they know they are being fed a falsehood. I don't believe that the vast majority of people believe there are no biological differences between men and women, but they just won't say it. People are understandably afraid because there are serious repercussions potentially from saying these things, especially if you say it in any sort of public forum. I mean, even if you say it in a private conversation or in, in a, if you are in, in an area of work that is completely unrelated, you can still lose your job and be ostracized for it and be mobbed on social media and have people going after your family and your loved ones. So I understand why they don't. I think it just it comes to a point where that people feel incentivized and they realize that the negatives or the risks that come from speaking out are far outweighed by the benefits that are going to come from doing so. And I've been thinking a lot lately about how to help bring that about because where we are right now, that's definitely not the case. People are getting canceled pretty much left and right every week. And I would say for people who are living in fear or maybe who do want to speak out, take it take a very practical approach. I would say start saving your income so that you can take care of yourself if you do lose your job for saying something that should not be deemed hateful or for speaking your mind and seek out people in your life who will support you regardless of what your views are. And you don't necessarily have to agree, but just have that mutual respect and, and that support regardless of political view. And I mean, it's just, it's gotten so ridiculous at this point. I do see a turning point coming. I just don't know how much longer that will take because I've set up my life in a way where I can speak about these things very openly, but it's not for everyone. And it's it's definitely not fun to, to deal with the harassment. But I think um, the the feeling that you get after you go through it, especially going through a cancellation, once you've gone through it, you realize you can do it. And it's it's, I think, much scarier thinking about what it's going to be like versus actually going through it. Yeah, I've I've um, often joked with with liberal friends or more liberal friends um, that to be a conservative is kind of to be pre-canceled. Um, it, it's interesting how the how the burden of these social cancellations, in particular, um, has fallen on those people who are left of center, who are hold some progressive views, but um, have dissented, whether it's on sex and gender or on some of the critical race theory stuff. Um, it, it seems like uh, the most opprobrium is actually poured on people who are uh, 
otherwise liberal, but find these um, this particular strain of the left to be pernicious and dangerous and contrary to what used to be bipartisanly held positions about free speech and open inquiry. Um, so I guess my, another question would be, um, where, where do you think the future of this alliance between um, the liberal left, or which that's what I'm going to call you guys, <laughs> the the liberal left um, and, and the right can go? Because, um, for example, there was that Harper's letter that Thomas Chatterton Williams um, circulated. And some of the people on, and I was very supportive of that letter. Um, I thought it was a, a great thing to do. Um, and I'm actually a big fan of, of um, his work. But uh, some of the people on there had uh, encouraged um of a sort of cancellation of people to their right. Um, and I understand the impulse because there, there always are some boundaries around what is considered mainstream conversation, right? Um, it's never been good for your employment prospects uh, to have a swastika tattooed on your forehead, right? Um, so, so we are uh, talking about now what deserves to be in the mainstream. And, and one of the things that concerns me is that we have this increasingly powerful part of the left, um, not only in this country, but in Canada and in some European countries increasingly, um, that believes that 80% of the country um, or 80% of the political spectrum deserves to be canceled. I mean, as, as you're saying, there, all things must come that, that must come to an end eventually end. You, they can't possibly cancel 80% of the country, can they? We hope not. <laughs> But I do have an entire chapter dedicated to cancel culture in academia because, as you said, you know, anyone who dares to go against orthodoxy on these issues, they face really serious repercussions. And it's it's really scary because I see things growing increasingly politicized and uh, the right and the left, for the most part, can't really speak to each other. And I think I do sense, and this is something I've been grateful of from conservatives, is that my sense is my, my friends and colleagues who are conservative, they're much more open-minded to the differences that we have. And they know that we don't agree about everything, but they're still willing to have a conversation and even debate the issues. But my sense from the extreme left is that there's no debate, no bait, uh, debating is considered being complicit. The, the only option is to shut people down. And so I, I'm not sure how we're gonna get around that because if you can't speak to people you disagree with, there's no understanding that's going to to be made there it's just going you're you're going to continue seeing the other side as the enemy or not even the other side it's people you disagree with are going to be seen as the enemy so that's a real problem but i would say for the 80 percent, that's the thing we are the majority of people we are the, the sane people in this situation so there's no reason to feel ashamed or afraid or to ever um question i guess because that's the other thing i find really unfortunate is that people sometimes think by questioning it that makes them a bad person or especially for progressives i find they feel that to be a good progressive you have to you have to go along with this agenda even if you personally disagree with it because that's what it is to be a good person and i would say no you can question this and you can go against it it doesn't make you a bad person um, let me ask you then uh, a conservative question, right? Because um, I know that you're always sort of having to fend off from your left um, accusations that uh, you are too conservative. So let me make that clear that I'm to the right and I'll, uh, I'll ask you a question from the conservative direction. Um, you know, I've increasingly come around to the idea that it might actually be a positive thing for society to embrace certain sex stereotypes, as long as, to circle back to an earlier um, point of our conversation, as long as there is some room for essentially weirdos, right? Um, that that it's fine to be um, a little bit strange to be on the, the uh, to be the exception rather than the rule. Um, but, you know, how do we balance those two things? Because I increasingly, I worry that societies flip the opposite direction um, in terms of, of young women, as we discussed, of almost pushing them away from their femininity um, and and telling them that it is bad, uh, for example, to prioritize um, interpersonal relationships over the career ladder, um, or and that's somehow unambitious or it's bad. Or um, but but I worry that a lot of women, and if you look at the data on female happiness, um, both female and male happiness have been declining, self-reported um, for decades, but female happiness since the 1970s has declined 
more precipitously. I would think that from, you know, from knowing you and reading your work, that your answer would be sort of society should be neutral, hands off, and just let, you know, sort of biology and um, individual, individuals develop as they will. And, and there should be no stigma or um, from society in any way. I wonder if that's a realistic, um, a realistic idea in that society always has something to say about our sex, especially about how we express um, gender or sex. Um, and to my mind, it, it seems a bit of a libertarian impossibility to me um, that society has nothing to say about something as important as sex. And, and um, that perhaps as a conservative, it seems like it would make more sense to me to for the societal messaging to be the, essentially the dominant, the majority, right? Um, that we should expect girls, um, and the societal message should be that we expect girls to be and turn out feminine, but of course we don't ostracize them or, or um, you know, certainly we don't, you know, legalize or, or create laws to force them into being in particular gender roles, but that there should be sort of a soft establishment, if you will, um, in favor of traditional sex roles. I'm wondering how you'd respond to that. I guess the progressive in me would say, See, this is the thing, it's gone, this messaging, which I think at the core is good, has gone so far in the opposite direction now, which is that there should be space also for those people who are not stereotypically feminine, who do not feel that they are stereotypically, um, that they align with necessarily stereotypical female roles, and to let them know that that's okay too. And I guess my concern would be that if if we're going in one direction or the other, either either for going in the direction of, say, traditional roles versus what we're doing now, which is in the extreme in the opposite direction and pushing for this idea that men and women are completely the same or there are no differences or that women should be like men. Ultimately, it's it's not giving... I mean, I think people, individuals, at the end of the day, are going to do what's right for them, regardless of messaging. Whatever they're going to gravitate toward and how they want to live their life, I think they will, to some extent, find their way there anyway. But... I guess I'm I'm more so, like you said, more hands off, and I just think that it's good to at least leave some room for the outliers, but we don't have to completely center everything on them as well. Yeah, I'm I'm becoming, um, you know, increasingly convinced that there can be no uh, at least exciting and vibrant counterculture without there being a culture. I, um, I it it's almost makes. The exceptions more exciting. Um, it means that they can find communities, and, and um, I know you, you write a lot about how um, you know how enmeshed you were in the gay community growing up, um, and continue to be. I've, I've heard this from some of my gay friends as well that it, it, it's sort of um, because now um, gay pride parades are a matter of let's say you know Delta is rolling a, fl a float down the <laughs> down the parade and um, it's it's become corporatized and standardized and mainstreamed that actually there's something in, in some sense lost there obviously um, the many things are much better the, the legal recognition is better the, the legal protections are better um, but that that there was something beautiful about like a sort of counterculture that flourished in strong opposition to the dominant culture and I'm wondering if we can make this, um, biological sex a little bit like that, that we have some some general societal standards. We expect generally that, that women will be feminine and, and men will be masculine. We actually encourage those attributes in a healthy way um, in boys and girls respectively, uh, but but that we leave room for these, these vibrant, um, you know, sort of countercultures or, or um, people who don't fall into those those stereotypes. But perhaps that's um, perhaps that's just as uh, sort of pie in the sky as as um, I think that a sort of perfect libertarian neutral societal messaging might be. Um, so <laughs> the crazy thing to me is that I feel traditional views on gender have become a, a counterculture in a way. I mean, I think it depends on where you are. But that's something I've definitely noticed. And then when I talk about, say, gender neutral parenting in the book and how you have some parents who are so progressive and they've just taken it so far in that direction that I'm thinking it's almost become a counterculture to say you, you're going to let your kids be gender typical and play with gender typical toys. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I, I worry that we're by pushing particularly women i think um I, I worry about men in a whole different way and, and you you talk about this in the book as well about you know the idea of toxic masculinity that um 
masculinity is somehow dangerous or um, bigoted or, um, you know, negative. And, and we're messaging this all the time to young boys. Um, and I do think that's damaging, but just being a woman and then being a former girl, um, you know, I, I can definitely see myself um, even, even as it is, even without the, the transition, the specter of transition and, and sort of um, solving quote unquote, my, my um, insecurities about being, being a woman. Um, it just, I, I can see in my own life, how many decisions I've made because I, that was just, it, it was, it was bad. Somehow it was looked down on for me to make a, a more feminine decision that it was irresponsible in some way. Um, and I, I worry about how many, I mean, obviously I'm, I'm fine. <laughs> I made it through, but I, I worry about how many young women are going to make perhaps not even as large a decision as surgical transition um, would be that is completely irreversible, but um even smaller decisions, right? Like the decision to to go to a um, more prestigious college versus staying in a town where you might still have connections to friends, family, boyfriend, um, those kinds of decisions uh, that change the trajectory of our lives. And somehow, sometimes we we wake up and realize that our lives didn't go um, as, as we expected them to. I, I worry about that. Um, obviously, that's always the case, though. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's hard no matter... In in various contexts in terms of knowing whether you made the right decision or not. But I, I do hear you in that way because I do I do worry about young women and I do think that their concerns today are not being addressed in a way that's actually helpful to them. It may superficially seem that way. The messaging may be positioned that way, but whether it's actually fulfilling and useful to them in terms of the information they're being given is something completely different. So um, for our final question here, I'm going to circle back to the idea of um, bravery, which which you've obviously displayed. Um, and, uh, you know, James Damore's memo, who you referenced and, and you defended in a column, um, it talks about how to encourage more women into STEM fields. He actually has some, some really interesting ideas about how to do that, make it more interpersonal, make it more, um, you know, collaborative. Um, so but I, I'm going to ask a, a sort of a similar sounding question with a different meaning. You know, how do we encourage more Debrissos, i.e. not more women in the STEM fields as you are, not more female scientists, which I'm not worried about. Um, but how do we how do we encourage more truth tellers, right, in, especially in the sciences, especially in academia, um, with those high consequences that we, we've discussed, you've discussed in your book, we discussed today, you know, how do we encourage more scientists to speak out about sex and gender, about things that they they know to be true from their research? How do we get people to actually do the kind of research that you did want to do? Um, because, uh, you know, you left, I know you talked to other friends, um, your tenure doesn't really protect you if they really decide to to come after you. You know, we need this research. So how do we encourage the next Deborah So who is in, um, you know, studying a, a medical field or a, a math or a, um, you know, um, a neurobiological field as you did um, or a sexology field? How do we encourage them to to go ahead and do that research? How do we get it funded? How do we publish it? Do we have to, as Barry Weiss says, just got to build new institutions um, and, and make a place for these people? How do we go about doing this? I would say just stick to your guns and do what you want to do and face the backlash if you're going to face it when it happens. I do have colleagues who are still doing amazing work in academia and they've had faced a lot of um, pushback, but they keep going. And I, I do think it'll come to a point where all the good people are going to um, either quit, get fired, or hopefully other people will grow a spine and defend them. And that's the thing, because for me, I was very, very fortunate. I gave a talk at the Oxford Union recently, and there was a huge um, push for that talk to be deplatformed and canceled. And the president, James Price, said that, no, the talk is going to go ahead. And I thought, I was, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I was so, so thankful that he made that decision. And we just need more people like James Price who will say, these are petulant children for the most part. Like these students who were petitioning, calling me all kinds of names, but they couldn't actually address any of the points I was making. I mean, they don't have a point. It's one thing if you actually have a point to counter someone's argument. But if you're just going based on peer pressure and bullying someone and, and calling them 
like making personal attacks, you have no ground to stand on. So we just need more people to collectively be brave, I think, and, and stand up against this. Because what happens is then the bullies see that we're not going to take it. They're going to have to go somewhere else. And eventually they're, they're going to give up. They have to give up. On that optimistic note, um, I'm, I'm going to wrap this up, but please buy and read Dr. Zoe's book, The End of Gender, Debunking the Myths About Sex and Identity in Our Society, which you can find for now um, anywhere books are sold, as you did have a, a little bit of a, a hiccup with Target, but um, we managed to get your book relisted on Target. Um, so as for now, I believe you can buy that book anywhere, uh, Amazon, Target, um, and so Dr. forth. Thought- Sorry, it's actually not on Target's website anymore. I would say get it at Barnes. Back down. I would say get it at Barnes and Noble if you can, because they've been so supportive of of the book. And please get it before it's gone for good, because I do worry that it's just going to be taken off the shelf completely at some point. So go to Barnes and Noble then, um, and and absolutely get this book. Uh, you can also check out her her recently launched self named podcast, the Doctor Deborah So podcast. Um, Deborah, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on High Noon, and thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so much for having me.